All right, everyone. Welcome to the Dries Note Q&A, or really the Ask Dries Anything session. Um, we are your hosts. I am Tim Lennon, Hestinet on Drupal.org, the Chief Technology Officer of the Drupal Association. And with me... Hi, I'm Joy Garrett, Joy Garrett on Drupal.org, and I'm the Community Contribution Coordinator. Awesome. And we're here with Dries, who I think you know, and hopefully you got to see the wonderful keynote today about uh, accelerating innovation in Drupal and the kind of steps to bring us along that journey. Um, our hope is that if you have some more questions about the uh, sort of nature of this plan, this vision for the future of Drupal, you'll submit some of those questions um, and we'll jump in and get started as well. Um, again, as housekeeping, you can scan this QR code or use this link and enter the code to ask any questions that you might have. You can also view the questions that are already submitted and vote them up if you'd like to do that. And you are also welcome to come up to the microphone um, and ask a question live if you would prefer. So with that, I think we'll jump in. All right. So our first question for you, Dries, is why was it important for Drupal to be recognized as a digital public, public good? Yeah. <clears throat> so a couple of reasons, actually. I'm trying to order my thoughts here as I see the question. Um, first of all, I think it's a great recognition of the work that we've done and what we stand for. Uh, it's an important recognition. And I think it will help us in a couple of different ways. Um, First of all, we talked a little bit about this in the keynote this morning, but we want to do uh, more philanthropic, uh, you know, we want to do more fundraising, grants, applying for grants and other philanthropic efforts. And I believe getting recognized as a official digital public good is, is a great thing for that because, you know, uh, potential grant writers, they're probably more likely to fund something like a digital public good than, let's say, a more commercial kind of alternative. And so from that point of view, uh, I think it's a great thing. Um, and, and I actually I think that I, that notion extends to uh, potential end users as well. Imagine you are in the public sector and you want to make a choice between two competing um, you know, CMSs, let's say. Um, it seems like a logical choice to go for a digital public good because of the kind of side effects of being a digital public good, and in our case, it means, um, you know, that other organizations can benefit from the investment that you put into Drupal, right? So this notion, as a as a public institution, um, that's a good thing, um, and so these are just two reasons why I think it's a great thing for Drupal. It will help us attract money from grant writers, I hope, and two, it will help drive adoption uh, because organizations are more likely to select a digital public good over, let's say, a commercial proprietary alternative. And I think it's actually worth um, saying out loud or expressing more clearly what we mean by digital public good, because you may not be aware that the digital public good designation comes from a United Nations program, a digital public good alliance that evaluates a variety of open projects. They can be open standards bodies, they can be open source software, they can be uh, open data sets, a number of different things of these kinds. And this um, United Nations organization evaluates whether these projects or data sets or other things uh, advance the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, their 20-year their vision for building a better, more equitable uh, global community. Um, and they felt that um, Drupal was a, was a clear choice to include it in no small part because the website that hosts the Sustainable Development Goals is hosted on Drupal. Um, so I think it's a really good choice. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so here's an interesting question uh, that we got a lot, and it's relevant to our, mm -hmm. our keynote today, which is, what do you think about technology, the concept of technology fads? And I don't mean to make a value judgment necessarily with that phrase, but most recently we've seen a huge rise in crypto, tons of investment, booms and busts and court cases and people fleeing to Bermuda and all sorts of things. It's been a little bit tricky. And now it feels like the whole world is abuzz about AI and what's coming next. So what's the difference between hype and innovation? Well, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure there's an easy answer, to be quite honest. Personally, I see um, the potential of both technologies, both crypto and AI, but there's a big but. <laughs> the but is that we need to sort out a lot of, um, you know, 
it doesn't mean they'll win because I think we have to make sure that we develop those in the right way. For example, one big issue with crypto is just the impact on climate. So I believe in the potential of crypto, that's maybe a better way to say it, but not as it is today. And so usually what happens with a lot of technology is that they start off really like sort of in a suboptimal state and, and over the years to come, you know, we, we, we become more efficient and we figure out some of the problems with the technology and that could be technical problems, but also uh, ethical and, you know, regulatory problems. Um, and sometimes some of these problems stay, you know, like sometimes they're never truly resolved, but they can get better. And there's a lot of examples of that in our life today. I mean, think about um, like cars, obviously cars are useful. <laughs> Everybody almost has a car, but they're also really bad for climate as well, right? So that doesn't necessarily prevent the technology from succeeding, but it does cause decades of research around how to make more, um, you know, more efficient engines, for example. And so I, I feel a little bit the same way. Like, I recognize all of the issues with crypto. I recognize the issues with AI today. At the same time, these may be kind of unstoppable trends. And I feel more bullish about AI than about crypto, to be quite transparent about that. But I, I think AI is an unstoppable trend. I mean, it is going to be part of our future. Then the question becomes, how can we make it, you know, a part of our future in the, in, in the best way? Like, what can we do to help advance these things in a way that is aligned with let's say our values in terms of um, yeah, how, these, how these things can work. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I think they're both innovation to be quite honest, um, but like with a lot of innovation, they go through a hype cycle where there's a lot of hype and then over the years we kind of figure things out. Um, but crypto, I like, you know, I like the potential in terms of like what it can bring in like in governance models, for example. Um, and, you know, AI, I think it's going to honestly re... I, you know, I think the whole digital marketing world is going to be turned upside down. And we're going to see, a comp like, there's going to be a big evolution of how people create content, how people brainstorm content, how people create personalized website experiences. It's, that's all going to be AI-driven. So, you know, we got to figure out what that means for us and how we can participate that in a like in the, in the healthiest way possible. And actually, just to follow up on that a little bit, by participate, do you mean that in terms of, you know, regulation advo advocacy, or do you mean more specifically how Drupal could perhaps innovate and sh set an example for a responsible use? Yeah. yeah. Well, first of all, I think is we, we should try and participate in wh wherever we can and to help steer it. And the beauty of Drupal is we have a large platform. We have a lot of users. So we do have a voice, I think. We just need to get ourselves at the table, uh, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I mean, all of those things. Yeah. I, I don't know, it's probably not always a, a popular answer, so to speak, but I do think, you know, these things are, they're here, you know? Thank you. So I've been with the DA for about a year now, and one of the first things that I tasked myself with was attending um, Drupal camps. And as someone who doesn't have a lot of Drupal background, I found it really helpful. Um, the camps feel really accessible, and I'm always like really grateful for how welcoming the, they are. So since we know that they're the grassroots of the community, what's something, you, what's something that you think they do really well, and how can they evolve? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think what they do really well is kind of what you said, in the sense that they're really, really, really helpful in, in knowledge sharing and, you know, sharing information about Drupal and getting people up to speed on Drupal. So I, I love that about Drupal camps. And um, you can see often, like, um, the importance of Drupal camps. Like, there's a lot of um, places in the world where they have a really good Drupal camp and the community is really thriving because of that in that area. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with the size of the city or the location of the city because there are certain regions, like major, major cities in the world where the community is just doing okay or not okay. <laughs> and then there's small cities 
in remote places in the world where the community is incredibly successful. And I attribute a lot of that to the local leadership, the people that organize these local events. Uh, so it's really important for knowledge sharing. It's really important to uh, build excitement for Drupal. So I think that's what they do really well. Um, I guess the second part is how can they evolve? Um, I think that's also a great question. And uh, I'm not sure I have um, like an answer that applies to every camp, because I think every camp has their their strengths and their weaknesses, so to speak. But one thing that I would love to see is, uh, in light of what I talked about today, is like how can we use the camps to uh, get more people to contribute? Mm. Like, can we? And I don't know if every camp does that right now, um, but that would be great if like every camp had like a mission to help kind of create more contributors. Um, and yeah, I think that would be great. And when I talk to people, often they start their Drupal journey at a local event. Mm -hmm. And then it, sort of they graduate between air quotes to DrupalCon, you know? <laughs> and that's a, also a nice thing to see. I, I, I talk to quite a few people. They say, oh, I've been going to Drupal Camp Florida for five years or Drupal Camp, you know, Denmark or whatever it is. And then eventually they make the big trip, you know, the big trip to Drupal Camp no North America or whatever the, the European DrupalCon is that year. So I think they're important to recruiting people. Um, and I, I, I would love to see them kind of get better and better at turning people interested in Drupal into very passionate Drupal people and then contributors, so. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome, our next question is about local communities and reaching out into larger parts of the world. So it is, what can Drupal do to be more active in the global South, South America, Africa, Oceania, and et cetera? Good question, too. So I've been privileged to travel um, to many locations around the world. Uh, I've not been to Africa. I'd like to do that. Uh, but I have been to many other places, and I've met with the local community. And one of the things I've seen is um, that language um, like, you know, because most of what we do is conducted in English, that can be a real barrier for a lot of local communities. So I've been to, you know, Japan, I've been to China, uh, and, you know, many other countries. And you can tell when I meet with the community, when we do events, like lots of people can't, are not fluent in English. And so one of the things that would benefit um, those communities is just having documentation in their local language, maybe Drupal books. I mean, I remember, going to China, for example, and where, where English was a major barrier. And I thought about sort of the, um, the ROI, <laughs> the return on investment of just having a book. You take one of the better Drupal books that are published in English, you pay somebody to translate that book, which I don't know how much that would cost, but it's not that much money to translate a book and then make that book available in a country like China where you have, you know, a billion people, right? And these might be interesting experiments, like how can we get more and more people involved in the local community? So I think language and availability of documentation and content, videos, these kinds of things are a huge barrier. Um, yeah. I think perhaps if we could bring more multilingual content directly to drupal.org, yeah. That could help as well. Yeah, exactly. That would be great, I think. Um, there's many other things we can do, but that's the one that kind of stands out for me. It's also great, actually, I met already some people from uh, some of these continents. Um, you introduced me to uh, uh, a gentleman yesterday as well. Yeah, we had um, a, a, a member of the Young African Leaders Fellowship Program, uh, Denia Dennis, who may or may not be Hey, hey, sitting right here. Sorry, can, uh, we actually can't see many people because of the lights. <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah, it's very like joining bright. us from South Sudan. We have people from Burkina Faso, Sri Lanka, like all over the place. A lot of the people, a lot of these people that we want to reach are coming to us yeah. as much as they can, and exactly. it would be great to reach out back to them. Yeah, and, and we were talking a little bit about, um, you know, how he made the journey, and then he would like attend m many different sessions and then take that back to the local community, you know? And so one of the things we can do is like continue these programs where we invite people from all over the world really to attend DrupalCon, learn about Drupal, and then 
bring those learnings back to their local communities. Um, that's a great way to multiply information and knowledge and excitement about Drupal. So that's, you know, one other idea. All right, so Discover Drupal is a program that was created to, um, to create resources and opportunity for marginalized people in Drupal. Why do you believe centering marginalized people in Drupal is important work? It's a great question. Um, I know what Discover Drupal is, but does that anyone, everyone know what it is in the room? Should we explain that in one sentence? <laughs> I, I don't know if everybody knows it, so, but it, I yeah. think it's useful. So it is about a year-long program where students come and they get the training that they need in order to, um, to create their own websites and to be versed in Drupal. And they also um, get placed with a mentor to support them throughout their journey. And then we also connect them with resources and job placement. And it's just a really good opportunity to stay connected with um, people who uh, need support and extra resources so that we can make sure that Drupal is a truly diverse community. That's right. Yeah, thank you. I think it's helpful maybe, but yeah, it's a great program and um, actually the people in the program are here this week as well. So yes, maybe you get to meet some, on Tuesday. Uh, which is exciting. Uh, but why is it important is I guess really the question. Um, I mean, and there's a couple of reasons that come to mind. Obviously one, it's important for them but it's also important for us as a community, but it's important for, for them because we give them um, you know, more opportunities. Like people in, in mar marginalized groups, they're often in, in parts of the world where they're oppressed, they have limited career options, and so we really you know, help them learn Drupal and that gives them opportunity. And that's absolutely wonderful for the people in the program. And hopefully you know, they will spread that excitement for Drupal and their knowledge and bring more people into, uh, into the Drupal community, which gives them opportunities uh, in life. Um, it's important for us too, not just for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, we want the Drupal project to be diverse and inclusive. We want um, everyone in the world to use an open web and, and we want everyone in the world to participate in building a platform for the open web. I think it's important that we have representation, um, you know, from all of these um, different communities. So I think it's how we built the best software, you know, to in by including all of the, you know, everyone in, in the building of Drupal, because they'll have unique viewpoints um, that are different from the viewpoints of, of us or other people. And, and like, it's the combination of all the unique viewpoints and ideas that will make for the best end result. And so we benefit from that, of course. The hope is that the people that participate in the program, um, you know, continue to contribute to Drupal and play a role in Drupal. Of course, we don't control that, but our hope is that they become future um, participants and future leaders in the Drupal project. I think there's, to go back to your keynote, I think there's an opportunity for people who would not perhaps otherwise, otherwise had the chance to become one of the seeds mm -hmm. of perhaps the next major innovation or seed change. That's right. To to get a leg up and get the opportunity to to be in the room when those opportunities happen. Yeah, I attended. Um, there was a breakfast with Discover Drupal this morning. I couldn't make it this year, but I attended the breakfast last year, mm -hmm. and it was absolutely wonderful to sit down with people in the program and them sharing, you know, their story and 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 what they thought of the program and and the impact it has already had, just going through the program and how they look at things. So it was, it was one of my favorite experiences at the last DrupalCon, so yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think that for Discover Drupal, it's important because it acknowledges the inequities and it's a solution to, to it, and hopefully it can be replicated by other folks in the Drupal community in the future. Yeah, and, and lots of, um, by the way, the program is, um, Obviously, the, the Drupal Association plays a big role in it, but also other partners of mm -hmm. the Drupal Association, yes. uh, organizations giving time and money mm -hmm. um, to help train students for, I think it's several months, right? The yeah, program? Yeah, it's almost as close it's to It's like year. a multi-month training program where multiple um, you know, different agencies and Drupal uh, companies uh, contribute their, their time and money. So it's quite nice, actually. Okay, now we're getting to a fun one, which is uh, we heard a lot about Leica yeah, and the history of early photography. <laughs> You've gone pretty deep in this. So how did uh, yeah. how did interest in photography capture you? What was the bug? 
Ha, funny. Um, well, so I've, I've been doing photography. I'm, I'm actually not that good at it, but I've been doing it for a long time. Um, and I think it started with my dad having, like, a, um, a, a, like I remember it being a, a Canon camera. And it was a, an analog Canon camera. And as a kid, I was playing with it. I don't think there was actually film in it. <laughs> but I would just go around and like pretend, take photos. And then I also remember getting a camera for uh, Sinterklaas, which I should explain. <laughs> but Sinterklaas is a European, I guess, tradition. It, it's actually what predated Santa Claus in the US. Okay. Yeah, and it's on December 6th of all, I don't know why December 6th, and I think in some countries it's on December 5th. But anyway, uh, Sinterklaas comes to your house and leaves gifts, a little bit like Santa Claus and, you know, Christmas. And one year, I got a camera, and it was like for kids, so like with foam padding and that kind of stuff, like you could throw it and it would still work. And I started using that camera, and I guess that's how, and I must have been, I don't know, six or seven, you know, young age, I guess. And ever since I developed a kind of like an interest in photography. Um, and I would say recently, in the last year or so, two years, um, you know, that, that kind of passion was rekindled. Uh, you know, I kind of graduated to bigger cameras, I guess, and it become, became like a hassle to carry around. I would travel to DrupalCon with a camera backpack like a big lens, and I ended up not bringing my camera. And then about two years ago, I bought a smaller camera, and I've adopted this philosophy, always carry your camera, or almost always carry your camera. And as a result, I've been taking more photos. So long-winded answer, but there you go. <laughs> awesome, very cool. So I want to remind you again that you can continue to submit questions to the menti.com code or come to the uh, microphone here in the center if you'd like to ask a live question. And we're gonna go to some of the audience questions now. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna jump in. Yeah, why don't you take the one at the top? Okay. Adoption of Layout Builder has been slow. How would you sell Layout Builder to veterans of Drupal who has invested much in tools like contexts, paragraphs, panels, et cetera? How would I sell it or how would I? Sell it to veterans of Drupal. How mm -hmm. would you sort of convert them from maybe these Others. other tools into <laughs> Layout Builder? Yeah, hmm. that's a good question. Um, yeah, Layout Builder, definitely, when I talk to people, it, I mean, it's not necessarily Layout Builder, but when I talk to people, the thing that they ask the most about is like, I, I want to be able to build landing pages or simple pages. Um, and, you know, that's kind of associated with Layout Builder. Um, and so really people want those tools to get better and I think it's because our competitors like WordPress have gotten really good at those kinds of solutions as well as the SaaS vendors, as well as there being a trend towards empowering, um, you know, marketers and um, content creators with low-code, no-code tools. So Layout Builder is a big, a big thing for those reasons. I mean, I would say what Layout Builder is really good at in Drupal is in actually creating templates that can be applied, um, you, know, or, you know, that are associated with a content type. You know, I, I actually think Layout Builder today isn't very good at creating a single landing page. But what it would be good at is, let's say you have an e-commerce website and you have 10,000 products in your database and you want to lay out how each product looks in a templated way, that's today what Layout Builder is pretty good at. And that's, that's actually a pretty unique capability that some of our competitors miss. <laughs> but what we, what we miss is how do we create like a one-off page? Like when you start your website from scratch, usually the first thing a lot of organizations want to do is like, I, I'm just going to create an about page. You know, it needs to have a title, an image, two images, some address information, what have you. That's actually not that easy in Drupal to create like an unstructured page, if you will. But what we are good at with Layout Builder is structured pages. Um, so I think the opportunity is to, um, you know, make, get better at structured pages as well as embrace this notion of unstructured pages and bring that into uh, the Drupal core platform. Um, I'm probably not the best person to do sort of a comparison of all of the solutions out there, 
um, but there's multiple solutions and I, I think it has served different people in different ways. I think I would add to that that um, it was implicit in what you said that Layout Builder is often for a different audience than necessarily who we think of as the Drupal veteran, right? For, if you're the Drupal veteran um, developing the site, building the site in a deeper way, Layout Builder is a tool you're deploying for your users. I don't mean the visitors to the website, but the team that is gonna use the Drupal site that you've created. And I think thinking about it as a tool to help empower them and answer things that they might frequently come to you with frustration on um, is another way to think about that. Yeah, I'm actually quite excited about the two Layout Builder um, proposals being funded. The two that we saw this morning because I think well, we have these different solutions right now like the layout builder that's in core. We have Gutenberg for Drupal. We have Paragraphs-based solution. And quite excited about the idea of bringing all of the different stakeholders together and figuring out, is there a way to combine the best of all of these worlds, you know, and, 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 and create a path forward that allows us to build a really nice layout builder or page builder um, that we can use for, you know, for Drupal going forward. So I'm actually quite excited about Gutenberg, too. That's maybe a controversial statement, I don't know. Uh, but Gutenberg was designed to be an independent project, and WordPress is the largest user of Gutenberg. Um, but what I like about it is that so much effort has gone into it. You know, as 80 million websites use it, a lot of people love it. Um, and it seems difficult for us to out Gutenberg Gutenberg. You know what I mean? Um, it has just so much momentum, so like rather than building our own, trying to figure out resources to go build it, would it make sense to adopt Gutenberg and then contribute to it and make it better? Because uh, I'm sure once we look under the hood, we'll find all kinds of things that we would like to change. One, because it, we can make it fit be Drupal better, you know, for example, uh, let's say the structured content, maybe it's not well optimized for structured content or templated pages like Layout Builder does. So that would be something we can contribute to. Uh, maybe it doesn't meet our accessibility standards and we can contribute to that piece. But maybe by joining forces, you know, we can get to a great solution faster. Because if we are going to build our own Gutenberg, I mean, we'll be here in five years and talk about um, you know, how we've kind of just did some basic, you know, <laughs> some basic work, you know? And so anyway, I'm not saying we have to go with Gutenberg, but I'm excited about bringing all the stakeholders together to see what we could do. Um, and I actually had a conversation with Matt Mullenweg about this two weeks ago, um, not about specifically for, for this reason or anything, but uh, every time I see him, uh, every time I meet him, he's, he mentions like, hey, if you want, you can use Gutenberg. <laughs> and I'm sure he does that to other CMSs, but uh, he's, he's very keen on other, or, um, yeah, other projects adopting Gutenberg. So I'm sure he might contribute to that as well. So anyway, it's interesting, and we'll see what happens. Awesome, okay. So our next three questions are all related to sort of the ethics of the open web. Um, it's a popular topic here in our questions today. And I think um, I'll pick the first one here and we'll go through. Uh, you mentioned the open web as a key principle of moving forward with Drupal. How do you propose reconciling this principle with the need to protect marginalized groups from hate groups who use the same open platforms and tools? Yeah. It's a great question. It's a difficult question. And um, actually, let me start by saying that I don't always have the answers. And I'm also constantly learning about how, how to do these things. And I just wanted to say that because, <laughs> um, you know, it's a, difficult, it's a difficult topic in many ways. And, you know, sometimes there is not a right or wrong answer. Um, but I think to this question, I mean, this has always been an interesting challenge with open source, right? Because open source software, um, you know, is made available for free, everybody can use it, and, and, and open source software has been used for good and for bad. And unfortunately, our license, the current license, uh, does not really allow us to, or does not really enable us to do anything about it. Like, we, we can exclude certain groups from using Drupal. Like, it's impossible. 
And so this is not a new problem. This is a problem that's been in existing existence for 25 years and you know, in Drupal for 22 years. Um, so I don't think there is a magical solution. But I think what we can do um, on top of that is what matters. And what I mean by that is we can have our values and principles in the Drupal project, um, you know, and, and we, f we are focused on diversity, we are focused on inclusion, uh, we want to help marginalized people, um, and that's what we can focus on. And in the end, hopefully, the positive impact of all of that work outweighs kind of how people use Drupal for, you know, for, for, for negative things, you know? And I think in general, that's how technology often plays out. Like there's always a bad side to a lot of these things, but what we can, what we can tr do and should focus on is like making sure that it's used for good a lot more than it is used for bad, you know? And that starts with us uh, and the values and the principles and how we, how we act uh, in this community, so. Let's keep with these ones if we could all. So we did this one? Go down. That's okay. Fine. What are your thoughts on the openness of the web when it comes to causing harm? Do you think we should deplatform sites that support harmful organizations? Sorry, can I say that? I have this echo yeah. because of where we're sitting. What are your thoughts on the openness of the web when it comes to causing harm? Yeah. Do you think we should deplatform sites that support harmful organizations? Mm. It's a great question. It's also a difficult question because I don't know if we can, you know, at least as a Drupal community, I don't, we don't have that power because the license doesn't allow us to. Um, personally, I would love to see only good size use Drupal, you know? Um, yeah. And yeah, I don't know what to do about it is, is, is kind of... Like, I know we're a little bit dancing around the elephant in the room here, you know, and it kind of feels awkward too, but at the end of the day, we can't control the business policies of all of the different players in the Drupal project. I mean, that's, that's not our job necessarily, um, so. Fair enough. You know, I think, I think these sites, unfortunately, if we de-platform them, they'll go somewhere else, you know? So one more question along those lines, and then we have some more technical questions. You mentioned the license just a moment ago and what the license allows us to do. Um, so this question addresses that point. Drupal is open source. We can't control who uses it or for what purpose they use it. But what are your thoughts on new licenses emerging, yeah. things like the Hippocratic license that attempt to insert some kind of ethical use yeah. clause? Yeah. Well, my personal opinion of that is I think that would be a good thing. You know, I think... Um, I think the, the GPL has a number of shortcomings, not just this one in particular, but you have to remember the GPL is a 25-year-old license, you know, and the world has evolved dramatically in those last 25 years. And when the GPL was created, we didn't see the world the same way or we didn't kind of understand the global impact that open source would have. So, you know, I think I embrace the notion of evolving open source licenses to deal with these kinds of uh, learnings. And, and I mean that in the broad sense. Um, so the challenge is always like, how do you, you know, migrate an existing project like Drupal to a new license? It's, it's, it can be very difficult because you need um, copyright transfer depending on the situation. But anyway, there's like technical challenges <laughs> with adopting a new license or legal challenges. Like, let's say, to use, um, you know, just to use an example of, of, like, us, if we wanted to adopt another license, uh, technically, we would need to go back to every contributor, everyone that has ever contributed to Drupal in the last 20-something years, and get, like, their signature, almost, where they say, yes, I'm willing to relicense the software or the lines of code that I wrote from this license to that license. So practically speaking, it's impossible unless um, 
the new license is compatible with the old license, but adding additional restrictions to the GPL or current license would not be a compatible, would not make it a compatible license because the GPL is pretty clear and says, you know, everybody can use the software. And when you contribute to Drupal, um, you sign up for that license. You know, the idea is that you can use Drupal, but then when you contribute to it, the same rights will apply to it. You know, you can just like take something, change the, 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 the rules, you know, like so. Anyway, we're getting into a little bit of a maybe technical part here, but I just wanted to explain that to people because it's, yes, I love the idea of making our license better and overcoming certain limitations, and this is not the only limitation, but unfortunately, it's not that easy, is I guess the short version, you know, for the reasons that I mentioned. Um, Oh, thank you. It but, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it is a but huge like challenge. If, if I could ban intolerant sites from using Drupal, I, I like that idea. Yes. <laughs> all right. With more than half of all Drupal sites still using 7 and EOL approaching quickly, how do you see Backdrop CMS as fitting into the Drupal community going forward as an upgrade alternative? Yeah. So. So Backdrop CMS, um, maybe I should explain what that is too, but it's basically, I would call it a friendly fork of Drupal 7. Um, so um, some members of the Drupal 7 community uh, decided to create their own version of Drupal using slightly different principles. For example, they decided to fork Drupal 7 and adopt a, a backwards compatibility policy because at the time we were breaking um, you know, APIs, right? And so that's what they did. And um, in many ways, that has been good for Drupal in the sense that one, it provided a home for certain users of Drupal. But two, uh, we also learned from that and we actually took or adopted some of the policies that they started with and applied them to Drupal, uh, future versions of Drupal, like Drupal 8 and Drupal 9 and Drupal 10, etc. cetera. So um, I would say Backdrop has been a a net positive for the Drupal project. Um, and so to, to go back to your question, um, I think um, we're gonna make some announcements later today about the Drupal 7 end of life, and that will be done, I think it's around four o'clock at the Drupal 7 EOL session. So I don't wanna announce what we're announcing. Um, <laughs> but you know, at some point, um, people ne will need to move off of Drupal 7. And they, they, they'll, need, they'll have some choices, like hopefully they will choose to upgrade to Drupal 10 or Drupal 11, because I believe that's the best version of Drupal, the most powerful, capable CMS. Um, but I also recognize there is a lot of organizations that may not have the means to do that. And for them, you know, Backdrop might be a great solution, you know? Depends, I guess, but... Um, so I think we can, um, I guess, promote that as, a, as one of the options for people that are stuck with Drupal 7, you know? I think there's other options, like maybe you turn your site in a static website. That could be another option, depending on your site. So I think there's different options, and I would hope that all of the Drupal agencies in the room, when they work with customers that are on 7, that they walk them through their options and that they explore those options with them. Um, and then, yeah, kind of guide their customer in the best possible direction given the, the situation, so. Awesome. Uh, the next question is, no code and low code uh, application development, we'll say, has been on the rise. How's Drupal planning to compete with the ongoing stack of no code and low code tools that keep appearing? Yeah, I would say no code, low code has been um, a 20 year trend. <laughs> um, you know, if you think about the original web, it was all hand coded, right? Um, and then, you know, every year it becomes a little bit more WYSIWYG and drag and drop and a little bit low code, no code. So it's not a new trend, it's a multi decade trend. I think hopefully in 20 years when we do another one of these sessions. Um, that trend will still be active. I don't think it will ever stop. You know, it's a very powerful notion to 
enable anyone to build websites without having to write code. And the definition of a website is changing, and the power that we can put in the hands of users through low-code, no-code uh, is only going to grow. Uh, so I think it's a, an exciting trend. Um, I think the question was, what's the challenge? Is that the question? Or how do we compete with how perhaps compete? newly yeah. emerging, primarily no-code solutions? Yeah, so I talked a little bit about that in my keynote, but I don't think we can ever be the best no-code, low-code solution. Um, and I think that's the case because um, the best low-code, no-code solutions will probably be SaaS services, fully hosted. You never have to upgrade things, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think what we can be the best at is what I call this uh, ambitious site builder definition where we do an incredible amount of compelling low-code, no-code, but also allow people to go outside of that box. L like low-code, no-code is great, but it's usually also restricted. Like you can do everything. And I think the power of Drupal is that whatever you can dream, you can build. And you can do it with 95% low-code, no-code, and that last 5%, because of the power of open source, you can, you can customize Drupal. You, know? you can write a little bit of code, or you can write a lot of code if that's what you want to do, too. Um, and that's something that a pure low-code, no-code solution will never be able to do, as far as I'm concerned. Maybe, maybe they'll figure out a way at some point. But, um, and I think that's an empowerful that's a, that's a very great message because we don't box you in. You know, it's not, there's no vendor lock-in. You can use low-code, no-code to be very productive and, and be efficient, but if you want to do something more, something that we haven't invented yet, something that doesn't exist in the world, something that makes you very unique, um, you can do that with Drupal and you can go outside of the box. And that's how we can win, I think. Um, that's an interesting space to be, you know? There was a question. Maybe if you have a question, feel free to come to the mic if you don't mind. Um, I think it's partially because the session might be recorded too. Sure. Is that some, uh, creating the competition for a low-code, no-code site is the ability to create something that doesn't already exist that you would normally have to code. Is that something that AI could support? and give that power, you know, almost like a translator for someone who does know how to code? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think AI, you know, will, will help ambitious site builders in a sense, right? You know, I could see a, f a future where a certain customization that you needed to write code for was maybe not super easy and, and maybe you needed a senior developer to do so. But I can see a future where maybe a junior developer assisted with AI can make powerful customizations. Um, so I do think AI will help lower sort of the barrier or will, will make it easier for, um, you know, for many people to, to do advanced customizations that require code. So it could be, could be part of an ambitious site builder strategy in the future. Are we doing enough to bring more people to the Drupal community? Was hoping to see more people here. It's a great question. I mean, I, I, the answer is kind of no. We never do enough, you know? Um, I think there's always more to do. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, um, there's an incredible amount of, of work going on to bring people to Drupal, you know? Events, Drupal is being taught in colleges, people write books, blog posts, tutorials, a lot, of, a lot of work is being done. When we prioritize features in Drupal, we think about which features have the best impact or which features help us attract more people to Drupal. So we do a lot. I really do believe we do a lot, um, but there's always more to do. Um, I, I, you know, that, that could be an inv invitation to all of you in the room to find ways to help. Um, Looks like we have a question at the mic. Yeah, can I follow up to that? Are there any plans to have any more hybrid conferences given that COVID is still a concern and probably a reason why you know, attendance is not what it used to be several years ago? Yeah, the notion of doing either a fully virtual third conference or having more kind of hybrid content at DrupalCon, 
I think this is something that we've talked about before. One of the most powerful things we had during the DrupalCon global events is I met people in Drupal who I had never had the chance to see at a DrupalCon. There was no way, even in se separately from the COVID issue, there was no way they were going to be able to afford the travel and all those sorts of things. And I think those were highly successful. I think we have, you know, we talked about growing the fundraising for the Drupal Association, strengthening the, the foundation there. I think to run a third con, even a virtual con, is going to take some resources, but I think it's a powerful idea. There was a lot of value in what we saw there. Um, and so, I, you know, I personally, I'd love to see it. See yeah, me it. too. It was great. I remember um, it's called Drupal Global, right? Um, it was great. I met people from all around the world that I would not have been able to meet if it was an in-person conference. At the same time, I love meeting in people in person as well. Uh, so I love the idea of doing both, really, <laughs> combining combining the two. Like, and I also know some other open source projects. I was I was a, actually a keynote speaker at um, a conference organized by Git Kraken or something around Git, believe it or not, and then like 20,000 people on a Zoom. <laughs> and so like, I think you can also reach incredible amount of people using a Zoom conference if, if, if it's done well. And their format was really interesting too. I think every speaker had like 10 minutes. It was like fast and very quick learning. You know, it wasn't like long presentations or anything. So it's an interesting format. Um, often these things come down to, you know, resourcing and all these kinds of things. But I like, I like the idea of virtual events personally. And we have another question. Yeah, hi. I posted it on the thing, and it's probably next as well, but I wanted to triage off of it, which is I've been developing Drupal for like 16 years now. And I think what I noticed is when dev desktops stopped, um, it was not easy uh, for local development to continue as far as moving from Lando and DDEV, Docker dependencies, now moving, you know, my, having NPM, all these versions, trying to get a local development going isn't, to me, um, well adapted to someone who isn't an engineer, frankly. Um, and so I'm curious to see or to understand if there's a plan to bring back a UI tool again for local development. And in the second part to that is, if not, how does that dovetail with this notion of ambitious coder? Because mm -hmm. to know how to debug all of this kind of stuff is, to me, a level above that. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, let's see. There is no like official plan to bring back a UI-based uh, solution. However, I, I will say I think DDEV and Lando, they've gotten easier and easier. Doesn't mean they're perfect. You still need to use the command line quite a bit, and that can be intimidating or difficult at times. But I actually recently switched uh, from Lando to DDEV myself, and it was surprisingly easy. And I was, I mean, I'm also, you know, a technical user, you know, but it was, I was surprised how little steps it took. Um, then there's also solutions that you may or may not have heard of, like, um, I think they're called Gitpot. Have you heard of that? It's basically, you know, with one click of a button, you can have a development environment in the cloud and they have free versions of that. Not exactly the same as a local development environment because you can't really use Gitpot on a plane, for example. Uh, or depending on where you work, you may not be able to use uh, those kinds of environments. Um, but those are also good alternatives for people to be aware of. Um, I would love to see a UI on top of DDEV. That could be a great proposal, maybe for a future Pitchberg or innovation contest, or maybe somebody in the audience will feel inspired to, to help. So I think it's definitely a great idea, uh, but it's not something that we... Um, are officially working on. But that doesn't mean um, other people couldn't, so. Yeah, and I would add, uh, you may know this having sort of 16 years of background in the community, but I would add for others, again, if you haven't gone to the contribution events uh, before, and if you join the First Time Contributors Workshop, you'll learn some of these tools. It's actually a really good place to get a leg up on some of these things. Learning Gitpod or Drupalpod, the sort of layer on top to help develop is, is a great thing to do. Um, we are running out of time here, I think. Uh, we have 30 seconds left on our clock, so I think we have to say our thank yous. Again, there's more questions than we could answer. There's some, been some great questions, and I think some tough and important questions that have yeah, been really yeah. worth exploring. And again, I don't always have the answers, but I'm learning with you, uh, you know, together with lots of people in the room, you know, 
how to navigate things like, you know, like those questions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Trace. Thank you all. Questions.